welcome to The Hive Podcast, a show that helps inspire you to pursue your passions and ambitions. My name is Jared Spink and I'm your host. I'm a photographer, videographer, and entrepreneur. Join me as I sit down with other entrepreneurs and creators to learn more about their process, how they built communities around their brands, and the experiences they've had along the way. I hope that these conversations inspire you to pursue your goals. You're listening to The Hive Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Hive Podcast. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. However you're consuming the content, I am happy that you're here this week because it's not too often I actually get to fanboy out on on a guest. I'm really stoked for this week's guest. Uh, as all of you probably know by now over the last two years, I'm a huge Blackmagic fan. I shoot all my videos on Blackmagic and I came across uh, Frame Voyager when I was looking into Black Magics. So we will welcome John to the show, the host of Frame Voyager. John, what's up, dude? Hey, thanks for welcoming me on. Um, glad to be here. I'm uh, glad you reached out and uh, decided to uh, bring me on this podcast. Um, it, it is kind of funny, um, always meeting different people who watch your videos and stuff yeah, right? and connecting to that way. <laughs> right? I guess it's a fun... Yeah, the fun thing at YouTube is just all the random people you get to meet and get to be friends with, even though you've never met any of them. So yeah, it's <laughs> it's just such a, a a great community, and I love your videos. They're they're super informative. They've your channel's definitely like changed and evolved since you've been doing it. Like I love what you're doing now with kind of like the comedic com like camera and tech news. Like I absolutely yeah. love it. The podcast is fantastic, <laughs> but. Um, for the listeners that aren't familiar with you, that aren't familiar with your channel, your podcast, kind of mm -hmm. run me through like who you are and what you do, what your channel is all about. Yeah. So I run, the, yeah, again, the uh, YouTube channel Frame Voyager and uh, kind of just started out, you know, uh, especially during the pandemic of just uh, um, like spending some time doing extra stuff and originally just doing black magic camera tutorials to kind of help people along because I just noticed there's like no one really getting in the weeds with black magic cameras and i've done way too much content on black magic cameras at this point um <laughs> but now i've kind of like since that and i've kind of grown it and, and seen this awesome community that's kind of um been built around that um i'm kind of i, I kind of wanted to have a purpose behind doing it and have kind of like the past couple of years really come to the point we're realizing that i kind of want to be a camera community for everyone essentially like filmmakers cinematographers videographers of all kind like all kinds it doesn't matter which industry you're in doesn't matter what you know level you're on you're all you know everyone's welcome on the channel or within our social um platforms and stuff uh just because i'd noticed such a um the community at large sometimes can be a little rough to people entering in especially you know as i mentioned the pandemic really has caused just this explosion of video content everywhere like every industry there's like new industries that have come out of it and there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to use cameras in industries that have never been tapped before so um i'm trying, trying to be that space like come here i'm not gonna like you know make fun of you for one autofocus in a cinema camera because I don't, that's cool i mean whatever you know it's um so that's kind of what the channel is and you know again having fun being sarcastic i i very sarcastic person so you should see that in some of the videos some people don't catch that i'm being sarcastic which is fine but uh <laughs> <laughs> i love it's it kind of with the channel <laughs> there's definitely a lot of humor there uh when you do like your camera update videos and kind of news news videos mm -hmm. i absolutely love it i think they're hilarious um when did you decide decide to start the channel how long have you been doing that uh, I so I've been doing you I've, I've done YouTube for a while besides just okay. doing this um so I mean I did stuff back when I was like a you know a, uh, in middle school high school like most of us did did like those dumb lightsaber videos you get those lightsaber effects you know, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. FX home and stuff <laughs> um and then just kind of moved into that and then uh um I, so I've been doing it for I guess for about two or three years now and just decided one day I'm like I really want to make content I really want to like I like I like doing YouTube as like this creative outlet because mm -hmm. you know I do a lot of client projects and a lot of corporate work in some different industries and stuff and after a while it's like it's fun the projects are fun but you don't always get to do everything you want to creatively and you got to kind of like got to meet your business deadlines so it was almost a creative outlet to where I could go make whatever I wanted the way I wanted um, and not have someone telling me like, you can't make it that way. So that's kind of yeah. how I kind of got into kind of got into doing that. 
Cool, man. I mean, I think that's a lot how a lot of creators get into it is because you're doing so much client work and you just need this outlet to express yourself and make the stuff you want to make because sometimes, you know, making client work is a lot of fun and it comes out awesome and you're super proud of it. And then other times it's really awesome. And then the client says, I want this edit done and this edit done. And then the finished yep. product is horrible, but as long as they're happy, <laughs> I guess. Or you know? they, yeah. Or they come back to you and you have this awesome music track under and it's all oh, perfect. The and like, well, we don't really, we don't like the music. And then they send you like the definition of a corporate sounding song. And it's yep. just like, you guys just don't even get it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I got to re-edit so, this whole thing now. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, how long were you doing like videography and, and production before you you started doing YouTube. Like how walk me through the journey of like what got you hooked <laughs> hooked into cameras. Have you been hooked ever since you were like a little kid or is it something that came later in life? Um, I've always loved like storytelling as a kid. Okay. Like I love for me, it's like creating something is a big thing for me even beyond. And I think just, you know, doing cameras like cameras and video, it's like just an outlet for kind of that, that passion from me. Um, but I mean, no, I actually have a business. I graduated with a business degree. I wasn't even in cameras when I got out of college. Um, I worked in politics for a little while, um, which I'm glad I'm out of that now. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, and then kind of like worked my way into doing, I did a bunch of social media marketing type of stuff. Yeah, I would yeah. even consider myself more of a marketer than a camera person at some points. Um, so I kind of I, I kind of started like the social media business and we're like, we do everything. We provide you with everything. You know, like everyone does when they're starting a business, they offer way too much. And uh, uh, finally, after a couple of years of doing that, I realized, wow, it's much easier to just do video work and uh, you get paid more. It's a lot less work <laughs> and it's so much easier to work with clients. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into it. But yeah, I mean, I was doing stuff back in high school, like doing those I remember those like Lego stop motion videos everyone used to do back yeah. early YouTube days. Yeah, I'd, I've done way too many of those. Uh, and <laughs> they're fun. They're fun. They're super they are. entertaining too. Oh man, so those that's, are great. That, that's kind of how I got started in doing video stuff and all that is just like, I like doing creative things. I'm a musician. Um, I've played at bands. I've done like all that kind of stuff. And I just love creating and telling stories and the kind of the, uh, favorite part about video is the kind of the dynamics you can play with it with the music and the telling mm-hmm. the stories and there's so many elements you can put together to tell a story and to me that's it's so much fun because i love putting like puzzle pieces together essentially for video yeah and that's what it is i mean every element brings something to the story and without it that story is just not complete it's just every little bit builds to that final product no one thing makes it that's so true. Um, you brought out a good point. Um, I've been diving into the business side of video production a lot lately. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you mentioned not offering like a ton of, of different services, kind of niching yeah. down. Um, why was that beneficial for you? What kind of like headache did offering too much stuff bring to the business? <sighs> I think as time went on, like, uh, and I, th- I constantly find myself doing this too, because it's trying to be in every different like social space you can be. It's the same thing with business. Cause I would do, I, I would offer social media marketing strategies, um, graphic design, um, building websites, SEO development, ad, you know, ad stuff and video content and all this other stuff. And it's just so hard to, unless you're a bigger agency and you have all these people you can build around, it's so hard to offer so many different services and be good at all of them. Um, just because everything changes, I mean, video changes constantly. I'm having to adapt to different things like, you know, on a monthly basis of how things are being done or, you know, how this is being done or what's going to capture people's attention. So I think narrowing it down to video helps me focus a little bit more, helped me to specialize a little bit more and really hone a craft a little bit more than trying to be too generalized just because you only have so much time in a day right and uh, that's still something i find myself dealing with constantly is i wish there was like you know another 24 48 hours in every day so i had more time to do is that the truth man that is because <laughs> yeah it's always like every day it's like okay what can i get to and what do i need to get to and like being realistic with myself about like it's actually going to take this much time i know in your head you think you can do all this stuff during the day but you can't you gotta like (laughs) pick some stuff so that i mean that kind of got to that point to help me narrow my focus help me kind of get into that role of doing it and like get better at a craft um 
instead of being all over the place. But I, I still feel like all that background of me doing, you know, social media, SEO development, websites, like all that marketing stuff has really helped with my business and even my YouTube channel, just because I don't approach it the same way as a lot of people do. Um, I guess with my with my business, it's very much like the name Frame Voyager. I didn't want to name it after myself, like Owens Photography, you know, because it, to me, I'm if we're working with a bigger client, I don't know, you know, you're going with them and quoting like, oh, from such and such Owens Photography or whatever. And it's like, yeah, eh, it sounds like a local company you're working with. So you want something that's brandable and something that sounds bigger than yourself and Absolutely. that you can grow into instead of being stuck with something that sounds like a like a mom and pop shop. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing a lot of freelancing stuff, when I was kind of doing it on the side, you know, it was going by my, by my name, but once I decided to go full-time, it was like, okay, that's got to go away. I need an actual business name. So yep. the business can grow as I grow, right? You got to, you got to think, you know, years ahead. So your business can grow. Um, I think you may, it's such a good point narrowing down. Um, I've noticed as I've narrowed like narrowed my services niche down to what i'm doing mm -hmm. it actually helps your business grow faster than offering everything i think a lot of people offer everything because yep. you want more business but ultimately like you said it hurts you because you end up just being mediocre at everything instead of being really good at like one or two things um mm -hmm. but it also like and <laughs> it's like a catch-22 you, you kind of want to do everything at first because you kind of learn what you're good at, what you're not good at, but it also yep. gives you all these different perspectives when you're approaching making videos, like doing marketing, doing websites gives you kind of an idea of how to make this video for this client and the purpose that this video is going to have for the client. Is it going on a website? Because if it is, it's yeah. completely different than like how it would shoot if it was just a, a video they're going to send off to clients, you know, as a pitch or whatever. Exactly. Because I mean, understanding how and why you're making a video and who you're making it for is incredibly valuable for your client because you want the videos to do well when you hand it off to the client. I mean, as long as they let you make what you think you should make for it, right? Because, you know, a lot of, they'll tell you all the time, like, oh, do this. I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, it's, it's all, it, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I was, I was going to ask, um, just for someone that, from someone that's, that's done a lot in the industry, that's done a lot of different things in the industry and probably worked with mm -hmm. a, a lot of different clients. Um, I always like asking some guests that have this experience in the production side of things, uh, stuff that I'm dealing with. I'm like, so how would you deal yeah. with this? Um, how do you deal with clients that say they have somewhat of an idea that they want? but they actually mm -hmm. really don't know what they want. Like they're kind of all over the place. Like I want this and I want that and I want this. How do you go about trying to work with a client like that and narrowing it down? Like, okay, this is what we're going to do first. Or, mm -hmm. or do you kind of just have to fly by the seat of your pants? I'm a very, I'm very good at flying by the seat of my pants. I really like, <laughs> I can literally like most of the time I just like, I don't love scripting a bunch of stuff for clients because I like it to be organic. So it's very outline ish. But if you're dealing with a client like that, the one thing I always remember is like at the end of the day, they want all this stuff in the video. You just do it. And then you have, you kind of have to like sift through what they're saying because half the time they're saying all this stuff up front and they don't even remember what they wanted at the end of it. As long as it's a good video and it fits well, it's some of it, like you, you, there's things you need to listen to them on. Right. And then there's other things you can just like, okay, you're whatever, you know, we're going to do it this way. Um, so some of it's just navigating what's actually important to remember and what's something that they're just saying because they don't understand the business and they don't really understand how putting a video together works. Um, so they're not kind of catching that. So some, some of it's just being patient with them and then yeah, also yeah. realizing, you know, some of it's like a lot of this extra stuff. They're not going to remember too much at the end of the day, if you have a good video and it comes, you know, it comes out the way it's supposed to. So, uh, yeah, dealing with clients is probably, <laughs> it's an I would say, it's yeah it is probably the biggest factor of you um getting more business and can retaining business it's not 100%. how like you you have to like make a you have to make good content right like i mean obviously there's a bar you have to clear with video right. but at the end of the day you, you're selling yourself to them and it's less about how everything's done and how the you know how, whatever the video turns out to be and it's more about do they like you? Do you get along with them? And one thing I like to tell a lot of people, if you're going into a corporate environment, I, I 
my big thing in my company, I don't like to make um, people that work with me or contractors come in like wear polos and stuff. It with like my, like just be, you're coming in there into a corporate environment where everyone is corporate. Like they deal with corporate people every day, all day, 24 seven. And you don't, I don't really want to come in there and be the same thing that they have to deal with. You should come in there and be like the fun people. You're the fun creatives that they get to come in. And it's like a party essentially. Yeah. Cause you're fun. You can crack jokes. You're totally different than what they get to deal with all day and kind of create that environment and like build relationships instead of being so like uptight and corporate, you know? Cause then I think some of that's too, is like, it does help when you kind of approach, you know, being with them that way it helps to relax some of the talent and stuff who are going to be on camera. Cause you're just, it's all fun. Like you're just having fun, cracking jokes, you know, you have to be, work within that like um, threshold too. Like if you have to wear, you know, a suit and tie, wear a suit and tie. But if you don't try to be creative, you know, a professional creative kind of look and dress and feel. And um, to me, that's key is to have fun with your clients, build those relationships and don't just give them the same thing that literally they have to deal with every day, all day. Cause right. You know, yeah, it just makes it makes a huge difference when you come in and they actually enjoy having you around and doing business with you. I mean, you mm -hmm. can make a great video, but if you're a pain to deal with, you're a pain to work with. Cool. That video was, was great. But like this guy's a jerk. Like, I don't like working with them. They're not going to come back. But if your video is good yep. or even if it's OK and you are fantastic to work with and you listen to your client and they feel like they've mm -hmm. been listened to, they're going to they're going to come back. And I think that's. That's what's important, even if the client doesn't have a clue what they're talking about, because they're yep. not the professional when it comes to making videos. You just smile and say, OK, yeah, that's that's a great idea. Maybe we can do that, even if you know it's a bad idea. Yeah. Maybe do it and don't use it or maybe just go about your business. But at least they feel like they were listened to. So I think they're that's, listened to. That's great. Yeah. And it's not advice. shooting down. Yeah. It's not shooting down their ideas right away either, because it's that relationship you're working. It's just you got to learn how to work with people who don't understand your business and try to also explain it to them on a, a level that makes sense. And then also like figure out ways to take what they're saying and then put it into a context it needs to be because right. they don't understand it. So you have to help them understand it. Yeah. Um, so and you probably don't know their business, yeah. right? So you got to kind of listen and figure out how your business and their business can mesh together and give them a product that they're happy with. So. Uh, yeah, great exactly. business yeah. advice. Let's um let's dive into <laughs> cameras for a second. Okay, <laughs> because yeah, I, I love cameras. <laughs> I love black magic, and that's how I came across uh your channel was looking at black mm -hmm. magic, you know, different rigs to build. Um, why black magic for you? Why did you choose to go the route of black magic out of all the cinema cameras that are available out there? What drew you to <laughs> black magic and their cameras? I mean, first off, the price, right? I mean, I mean which what what other cinema camera can you get at like such a low price with such good quality footage none i mean I, like yeah and then and the fact too that you don't have to you know if you have a red camera you're gonna have to buy their like what like two three thousand dollar drives you know 500 gigabyte card or whatever it is i mean it's so ridiculous it's kinda, <laughs> yeah so I, I just i just like how i mean i like the 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 company idea behind it um which I really found out more after I bought the camera. But I mean, initially, um, and I have actually did a video on the three years I've spent with the Pocket 4K, the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. Was the 4K um, your, the first, thing, your first uh, camera from them? Yeah, okay. it was. Yeah, it was. Like around the time it came out or okay. a little little after the time it came out because I think it's almost four years old at this point. Uh, crazy enough. But I saw I gen, I started off with Sony cameras. So I had like a Sony A7 III, Sony A6500 I would use for client shoots. And like so there's nothing wrong with Sony. I just I, I never loved their codex and like the S log to, you know, all the stuff you would have to go through to get it to work. And then half the time you'd be looking at the histogram. And it was so hard to maintain consistency with the cameras because like you could never trust what the readings were telling you. And you had to kind of like eye it and like do the best you could and then hope it didn't like look too overblown or something when you get back. And uh, I, I mean, I still look back. I made great videos with it, but I I was watching this like underwater video. I don't know who did this or who has the, the cages for um, or the rigs for three different cameras for underwater uh, for scuba diving. And they had a black magic pocket 4k. They had a Sony camera and they had like a G GH five or something. Um, and then looking at each of them and how it handled like the underwater footage, you could clearly like for me, I could tell like immediately the Blackmagic camera just had better overall quality and how it handled everything. 
and that's part of what sold me on it. Um, and that's when I kind of went for it and got it. And it just, it looks like a more professional camera too. Cause you got the bigger screen, you got that. And that's always something that I feel you have to kind of consider, even though it sucks to co- have to consider it when you're working for clients is that like, you kind of have to have eventually move into getting some bigger, more professional looking cameras. Mm-hmm. And even though you don't really need them like Sony, you can make great things with Sony cameras. I've yeah. seen plenty, you know, plenty of creators do. But it's just that stigma of like, oh, you know, it's like a, you know, uh, it's not big. Oh, yeah. you know, I constantly get from clients when you go in. I feel like, like oh, I go pick small. that up at Best Buy, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, and it doesn't really matter. And that's why I always tell people on my channels, like, it doesn't matter what camera you have. Like, it all comes down to skill, how you do things, and just getting better at filming and telling stories with stuff. But there is that perception thing. So that kind of like, it, the camera, like Blackmagic just kind of fit the bill with all of that. Plus, I mean, be raw. I mean, I I do so much run and gun, run and gun work that having that having a Kodak where you could change the ISO, the white balance and everything non-destructively in post was perfect. (laughs) I don't think there's any other camera for under $2,000 that you can shoot raw with and have that, that flexibility. Not that I can think of. No, it's just, I, 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 and it's, it, it, it honestly, you don't even need like a heavy computer to run B raw. Mm -hmm. I can. I mean, honestly, I have more trouble like trying to edit freaking GoPro files and um, uh, DJI Mavic Pro files and stuff than I do the B raw files, even though they're like ten times smaller. It's just they're at Black Magic. I gotta give it to them. Their codecs for their their raw. Okay, well, like hybrid raw because um, mm-hmm. we know raw Ed owns the patent for actual raw internal recording. But yeah. Really good, really good codec to work on, and I, it's really easy to work on it, like a um, in Premiere and stuff. Yeah, I to me, like it was the screen. The, the having that big screen is is a oh, bigger. Oh, the screen's excellent. It, it's yeah, huge. like it's fantastic. The, um, the menu the system, like how yeah. <laughs> easy it is to. You don't have to dive into like it's pretty bare bones, but it just gives yep. you exactly what you need. You don't need uh, anything else. Uh, like you said, the codec, like um, their their version of log, their their film, like it's mm. just it's the easiest I've ever worked with to get a a beautiful a beautiful image and to be able to mm-hmm. have reference lets in the camera or to bake them in or however you yeah. want to do it. False and, color, yeah, false color is huge. Like to actually nail exposure and yep. I, I mean I love having the reference let. Just how's this actually going to look? You know, oh, it's, it's just so the nice. easiest to work with and well, to actually it's easy. get a good image. Yeah. And the menu system makes sense. It's so, I don't understand why it's so hard for, I mean, black magic is a smaller company. They don't have the money that Sony Canon, Nikon has, but they made a 10, like their menu system is like infinitely better. And I don't understand what, like what's the disconnect with like all these other camera companies that you don't have a great like menu system. It's not that hard in today's age, but yeah, like all those things you mentioned, just it, you know, dual native ISO, just the way it handles all the different things. It's, it's such a great camera. But with that being said, if you want to get black magic cameras, you do have to make some concessions and you have to realize what kind of camera it is. That was my next thing was like, what are the weaknesses? (laughs) What are the downfalls to you when it comes to using, uh, you know, the pocket cameras? Let's just stick with those because those are probably the most affordable and in the, you know, most people's range. I mean, they're cheaper than uh, most Sony cameras that are out now and you get yep. a beautiful cinematic quote unquote looking image. Yep. So much easier and more affordable with a black magic, but there are a lot of downfalls, not a lot, yeah. but there are a handful. Like what, what are the downfalls to using a black magic? We well, got yeah, storage file, like file sizes are massive. I mean, I probably have like hundred, 200 terabytes of storage at this point from <laughs> like all the different projects. Granted, I do a lot, all my YouTube stuff and I have so much stuff that I like save and keep. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to keep it all, but the file sizes are way bigger. Um, it's you definitely have to at some point rig it up if you want to use it well. I have a video talking about how you can get started with it for under like I think I said like under seventeen hundred dollars. It could actually you could probably get it to fifteen hundred dollars. You'd have lens, batteries, and everything that you need for the camera to get started. But after that, if you want to work professionally after a while, you got to get a bigger battery for it because the, the LPE sex battery and it lasts for like 20 minutes. If they say 30 minutes, it's more like 20 minutes. Um, so, yeah, so you got to rig it up. There's a lot of different things. It's also it's a cinema camera. So while it does do very well in low light for what it is, it's not the the best in low light situations. 
Um, you know, because with a cinema camera, it needs it needs lighting. Like you can't. And I think with low light cameras, I think people get confused sometimes too that it's like, oh, it's just pitch black out. Those things should look great. You know, but even with that, you still need lighting. You still yeah. need to like actually do something. You can't just like expect a dark room to look magically better because oh, this camera films well in low light. I mean, yeah, but like, you know, you still need that lighting to tell the story well. So there is some of that. The um um so the batteries the low light uh, storage no autofocus yeah i, I uh, do kind of miss that like that's my biggest thing is like i miss autofocus sometimes sometimes it would be I, so nice to have autofocus yeah. <laughs> it would be and see that's the fun i mean i don't personally i don't know if i've ever really missed autofocus because i really love the at least the way i film i love the natural feel like even if you miss focus on stuff it's that that like you know like there's someone behind the camera yeah. doing it also this. depends what you're filming right oh for sure yeah yeah for sure uh but i mean there's no wrong there's nothing wrong with asking for autofocus in these cameras and that's that goes back to part of like people in the community just getting blasted for wanting different things than other people who are cinematographers and like the film community and stuff you know you go on like on facebook groups and stuff and you post stuff about Oh, I wish Black Magic would, you know, um, add autofocus into their cinema cameras, and then you'll just get eaten alive from people who, you know, tell you that you're not an actual cinematographer or whatever because you want autofocus. So, but I think I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think eventually you're probably going to see some form of autofocus in Black Magic cameras. Um, I think they're a little, f they have a challenge because they don't have they don't have any lenses they develop like Sony, Canon, Nikon, you know that mm -hmm. allows them to kind of integrate between the two that that autofocus technology That's a good point. yeah um because i mean you think about it most most camera companies that have that have lenses that go with it like even the rf lenses and stuff with canon now or i mean everything's getting so much better or nikon with that one lens with the mag like uh has like some kind of like mag magnets in it or something that helps to like make mm -hmm. it really smooth it's also the lens that can kill you if you have a uh um uh, a pacemaker with, yeah right. pacemaker i was trying to remember the, yeah. <laughs> so so i think maybe eventually black magic if they want to i think if they want to innovate in the future with some stuff i could see them purchasing a lens company maybe maybe making their own lenses i think that'd be a good step for them you see a lot of companies do that mm -hmm. um but i mean they don't necessarily have to um it just depends it's really going to be interesting to me to see how much black magic tries to set itself in both worlds of its prosumer but it's also for high end you know cinematographers and stuff that can use yeah. it cuz you know these get used on movies and stuff all the time like the pocket 6k i hear in movies all the time being used so it's interesting kind of the 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 bridge they've built between everything it's yeah. uh, kind of fascinating yeah. And the, I mean, the only reason I would love autofocus is sometimes I do a lot of real estate work. So when I'm working with an yeah. agent and they want to give like a home tour, mm -hmm. I would like, <laughs> it'd be nice just to be able to follow the agent and know they're going to be in focus all the time instead of saying, okay, yep. all right, my focus is set. You got to keep this distance between me and you. So we <laughs> stay in focus uh, yeah. because I don't want to pull focus while I'm trying to follow, like you're trying to do too many things and, and pay attention to too many things. Um, yeah. yeah. Some of that's, I'm curious. that's what, yeah. I, See, because I do a lot of like um, run and gun, like for in the manufacturing space, oddly enough, mm -hmm. um, of these shows where we'll go into these locations um, and follow these people around to like these crazy things that, you know, people are making. Um, like I've been to like stuff with like, like Joe Gibbs Racing, which is a NASCAR thing, seeing how they make cars or um, just like these high end like uh, tech thing you know, or like 3D printers and stuff that they're making to go to Mars and all that kind of stuff. And um I've always found with that, every time I film it, I figure out new ways to kind of like you said, like you're trying to balance so much stuff. So how how are some ways to kind of pare it down so you're only focusing on the filming? And some of that is like if you want to use these cameras in that kind of situation, eventually you're kind of going to need like a like an easy rig or a fly cam system mm -hmm. or something. When I got those, that kind of like made it made life so much easier for me you weren't killing your back anymore and it was just so much easier to like just control the camera and you know focus it and all that so i think it's just like trying to find those things that work for you yeah. in um and how you do it or autofocus or you know for real estate um i can imagine that'd be kind of yeah. annoying to have that uh 
my new setup is, uh, I mean, I have an easy rig. So the easy rig, mm-hmm. you know, is definitely going on. And then um, I got the tilt a ring with the RS2. Mm. So I'm going to balance it on that and then just do um, the, what is it? The wireless focus pulling just strapped on yep. the side of the handle. So we'll see how that works. <laughs> Hopefully hey, it's I mean, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a great setup for at least just for my back. Like I can't, yeah. your back just starts hurting oh, <laughs> really yeah. quick. I, I got the Ursa G2 last year for some client work and I picked it up. I'm like, yeah, I need to get fly cams or easy rigs now because it's so everything just gets so heavy. And then, then, you know, in my stuff, like I have so much stuff attached to it because you have like all these like cables and um, uh, audio devices. (laughs) Yeah. And especially when you're using bigger cameras too, like the Ursa, you get like, you have to get bigger and bigger batteries to power everything. Uh, But yeah, I don't do much gimbal work though. Oddly enough, I, I used to. Mine's I just got all tired. Gimbal of, work, really? Almost all, yeah. I just, I, I hate things that take forever to set up, um, and I just hate like it would just drive me crazy trying to freaking balance the thing. <laughs> and and, that, and we were talking before we recorded like that's that other than autofocus, which I can get by without. You can open the mm-hmm. app, like you can stop down the aperture a little bit, so you don't have to worry as much. Um, yeah. But like balancing that thing on a gimbal because it's just it's shaped like a football. It's it's a pain. Yeah. It's a real real pain. The weight just distribution is just horrible. not there. Yeah. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. I mean, like hey, when you're you mounting get... it, you're like, okay, can I mount everything onto the right side of the camera? Because <laughs> yep, yep. I, I need to counterbalance everything. Uh, and then you can also yeah. use counterbalance weights, but I don't like to. Hey, box cinema camera. Um, I hope. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'll be honest. I don't know if they're going to like make one. I think it's going to, if it is one, it's probably going to be in that micro cinema, micro mm-hmm. studio 4k line. That's what I'm really thinking. Did they make. just discontinue that as well? Yeah, that's yeah. That's, that was one of the videos I did was about um, like all of a sudden they were there and then they just disappeared from the site um, here recently and they're all back ordered. And actually a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, um, black magic cameras right now are back ordered, mm-hmm. which means we're probably going to get an imminent, um, I would say there's, there's going to be a camera release here probably within the first couple weeks of April. If history yeah. has anything to say about it. What I which, would like um, to see, and I, maybe you've touched on this. I, I don't know if you have in any of your videos or the podcast. So for those listening, uh, John also mm-hmm. has a super awesome podcast. Um, cause <laughs> it's, what is it? like frame voyage, you're ungraded. Is that, is yep, that right? Frame, yeah. Frame, yep. Frame voyage, you're ungraded. Yeah. Cause it goes, goes along a with, little more do, in depth. Yeah. Right. We, uh, we all, yeah. Cause we, every Friday we do a, uh, like a news, like almost like a parody news video on camera news, um, called ungraded camera news. So it's kind of just goes a little bit more in depth to the different stories and stuff we talk about in, in that show on Fridays. Yeah. So I wonder too, if they're going to, when they release a new camera, are we going to see a new mount from them? Because, everyone's going you know rf you got z mount mm-hmm. you, i mean sony's stayed with the e mount but like uh is canon even is anybody doing anything with ef lenses i mean some third parties are still making some ef lenses i think but they are but yeah canon i mean canon's done with ef lenses they yeah. even announced here recently that they're doing i guess 32 new rf lenses in the mm-hmm. next three or four years or something like that yeah. yeah they're done they're done with they're done with ef everything's moving over to rf and from what i've heard rf lenses are excellent yeah. um but i think it also goes along with some of their autofocus technology mm-hmm. and mirrorless technology so yeah i i new mounts um maybe it would be interesting to see if like if they did a pocket line or a, a box camera if they kind of go the ursa route which because the ursa you can interchangeable go, right? yeah they're interchangeable between PL and uh, EF. So it'd be interesting to see if you could add some more into it because there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of mounting options open to use. Like um, I had hypothesized with a friend, it'd be very uh, um, um, interesting to see like if a company or if they could figure out how to like make all in one, like uh, that different mounting option where you just have like one mount for like all these different types. Cause you can't do like, um, you can't do a Sony mount. You can't do um, RF mounts because it's all, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, Mirrorless. patented. Well, it's all patented too. So oh, like gotcha. you'd have yeah, to get, because yeah. um, Red actually has RF mounts from Canon. They have a little deal or something going. It's kind of interesting. But so you're kind of limited already with what you can do. And since Blackmagic doesn't really own any lenses, you mm-hmm. know, lens companies, 
kind of makes it a little hard where EF is a great place to start from, I guess. MFT is not bad because MFT can kind of go to anything. Yeah. Um, but I could see maybe more of an interchangeable mounting system. I think that would be a good idea for them just because of that. But I mean, a lot of people with these cameras use like cinema glass and stuff too. So that's true. Um, like, There's just not a lot of innovation with that older mount now that Canon's moved away from it completely. You know, everything's mm -hmm. coming RF. So just if you continue to, you know, release cameras with their old mount and they're not making lenses, how, how, how long will the third parties continue to make lenses for a mount that the manufacturer doesn't even make anymore? You know, so. Yeah. Which some of that does come down to, again, it's like with autofocus, like what the, what's the tech that they're using those new lenses with? Because there's nothing wrong with older lenses. I mean, people use some there's of those not. like vintage lenses all the time. I mean, the, like to be honest, like in the past 100 years, the construction of lenses has not really changed much. I mean, you have different like things out there on the fringes, like liquid lenses mm -hmm. or, you know, like nano lens, like weird kind of like stuff. But I mean, for the most part, they're all the same. It's just like different quality of, glass, and so, glass I mean, like, yeah so i mean like if i mean within the past 20 years you could probably find just lenses just as great you know just not yeah. with that autofocus ability or some of the things that are built into them so uh, ef's not True. terrible eventually they'll have to change it but i mean ef's a pretty standard mountings i mean everyone who doesn't have ef i mean yeah they're easy to find and adapters are easy yeah. to come by yeah for sure so well cool man oh i've enjoyed this conversation like i i love nerding out on black magic cameras um like i said i'm a big fan of the show i love the podcast and i look Thank forward you. to the the ungraded camera news every every uh every friday so for anybody that wants to follow along with everything you're creating on your channel where are the best places mm -hmm. uh for them to go um definitely youtube you can check us out on yeah frame voyager just search it will come up um and uh we also do if you want to just find some of our podcasts you can just look up frame voyager ungraded on that or you can go to our website that has a lot of our stuff uh we do if with every every week we, along with all the news we actually write articles along with a story to give a little bit more in depth looks at it and links out to other resources so if you're interested in a specific topic we talk about we put it on our website we have blogs review product reviews news stuff all, all sorts of stuff and the podcast there so just framevoyager.com so perfect easy to, easy to find <laughs> all right man that'll all link, uh, be linked down in the show notes uh thanks for coming on the show john yeah no problem thanks for having me on of course of course well guys i hope you enjoyed hearing me nerd out for like the last half hour on black magic and camera business in general john just makes fantastic content so definitely go check out the youtube channel and subscribe to the podcast and as always i appreciate you guys listening each and every week and i'll talk to you next week